During the first years of the American presidency, serving as Secretary of State was the stepping stone to the White House. Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe had blazed that trail. In 1824, John Quincy Adams stood to follow. But in this historic election year, other ambitious men wanted the job. You have a Treasury Secretary, William Crawford, got a Secretary of War, John C. Calhoun. Uh, in Congress, you have the Speaker of the House, Henry Clay. And there's also a rising national hero, Andrew Jackson, the victor of New Orleans, Old Hickory, tremendously popular, very, very popular. Significantly, 1824 was the first election in which states began to count the popular vote in presidential elections. This meant that a national candidate could accurately measure his popularity with the common man. In 1824, Andrew Jackson was the clear choice of the people. But the presidency was still directly decided by the Electoral College, and that race was too close to call. The way the four of them finish in the Electoral College is Andrew Jackson is first, John Quincy Adams is second, William Crawford is third, and Henry Clay is fourth. But Andrew Jackson does not get a majority of the electoral votes. Now, according to the Constitution, the top three go to the House of Representatives, which must pick among them. So Clay is dropped. But of course, Clay is the Speaker of the House of Representatives. The unknown quantity in this election is Henry Clay. Then, William Crawford had a stroke. So the contest came down to two men, Adams versus Jackson, with Henry Clay presiding from the pulpit of the House of Representatives. Clearly, some deal was made. The House picks John Quincy Adams on the first ballot, and John Quincy Adams picks Henry Clay as his Secretary of State. Now, Andrew Jackson screams bloody murder at this. And he says this is a corrupt bargain. It is a scandal. It is a scandal. And John Quincy Adams enters office under this terrible cloud of this corrupt bargain. Shortly after his election, John Quincy Adams received a note from his father. It said, no man who ever held the office of president would congratulate a friend upon obtaining it. Number six, John Quincy Adams, Democratic Republican, 1825 to 1829, 57 years old, from Massachusetts. Adams came into office with many lofty goals. He wanted Americans to explore the Western territories. He wanted to fund public education. He promoted scientific advancement and discovery. And he proposed vast internal improvements, such as roads and canals across the nation. Now, the problem is he doesn't get to do any of it uh, because the politics of his term are just so rancid and he is so unable to manage them. Before the oath of office had fully passed his lips, Congress began thwarting everything Adams wanted to do. This would haunt his presidency and leave Adams with few accomplishments. I think it's fair to say that the uh, Jackson followers in both the House and the Senate uh, wage a war of obstructionism uh, in, the, in the four years that follow. And so it's a very ill-fated presidency. Adams' personality did nothing to help his presidential agenda. Yes, he was the son of a founding father and acutely aware of it. But he was also his father's son. John Quincy Adams tends to be somebody with a uh, very strong self-righteous streak. Adams was physically short, pudgy, and stubborn like his father. And like Lyndon Johnson, he was a skinny dipper, although Adams took his morning swim in the Potomac River. He was also the first president to wear long trousers instead of knee breeches. John Quincy Adams came to the White House, much like George W. Bush did 175 years later, hoping to exorcise his father's political demons and retrieve a lost presidency. It's not as if he went into it by saying, 
I can do a better job than my dad by being more diplomatic or whatever. Quite the contrary, it was more like, I'm going to prove to those guys that my father was right. And of course, he went down the drain the same way his father did. More than anything, John Quincy Adams believed he could rise above the charge that he had gained the presidency through a corrupt bargain with Henry Clay. He did not worry about whether he himself had been corrupt, and I think that was part of his undoing. Seeking to prove his political purity, Adams refused to play the patronage game in Washington. This meant he would not hire people who were for him or fire those who were against him. The result was devastating. John Quincy Adams endures probably four years of what may be the most miserable presidency that any president has ever experienced. It is four years of unremitting attacks on him by the Jacksonians. In 1828, John Quincy Adams ran for a second term. But once again, Andrew Jackson stood in his way. In this election, American political opinion was sharply split. Those for Adams, who believed he deserved four more years, and those for Jackson, who believed their man had been robbed in 1824, the victim of the corrupt bargain. The one person who believed the charges absolutely, utterly, was Andrew Jackson himself, and he went home swearing eternal revenge, and uh, he, he got it. The election of 1828 was the dirtiest campaign in history. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, it was brutal. Jackson campaigned on his impressive war record. He was the hero of New Orleans, the conqueror of Florida, and a bona fide veteran of the American Revolution. But Jackson's past also included some unsavory behavior, which the Adams camp brazenly exposed. They accused him of being a gambler, a military tyrant. Uh, uh, John Quincy Adams called him a barbarian. In this contentious election, character was the main issue. The people on each side did everything they could to smear the character of the other man. And in the case of Andrew Jackson, they are really beyond the pale. They attack Jackson, and they attack his wife, Rachel. And the attacks on Rachel Jackson are really merciless. The dirt on Rachel was that she had married Jackson in 1791 before obtaining a legal divorce from a previous marriage. The charge was true, but so old that no one expected it to be an issue. But then, in the heat of the campaign, a Cincinnati newspaper published the damning story. When that Cincinnati editor uh, e exposed the details of uh, the fact that Rachel had lived in bigamy and that Andrew had lived in sin, you know that it tore his soul. He blamed Henry Clay for that. Uh, Henry Clay was a close friend uh, of the editor, and while Clay denied it, Jackson never believed the denial. So he despised Clay for the corrupt bargain, but came to despise him even more because of that attack on his wife. The Jackson people responded with equally outrageous charges against Adams. They would reply that he lived with his wife before they were married. He provided a young American virgin for the pleasure of a Russian czar. He bought a pool table for gambling devices, broke the Sabbath. Important issues concerning government were ignored. Instead, campaign rhetoric focused on the personal lives and character flaws of the candidates. What kind of a human being do you want to be in the White House? Do you want somebody whose wife is a whore, uh, which is essentially what uh, they accused um, Mrs. Jackson of being? Or do you want somebody who pimped for the Tsar of Russia, which is what they said that uh, Adams had done? I have to say this. The things that the Adams people said about Jackson were mainly true. The things that the Jackson people said about Adams were lies. In this election, the truth hardly mattered. 
Jackson's popularity with the common man proved to be overwhelming, and he won in a landslide. But the joy of victory didn't last. In December 1828, after buying her inaugural gown, Rachel Jackson died, suddenly, of a heart attack. She was 61 years old. This was a cruel blow to Jackson, and it would shape his presidency. Andrew Jackson is reputed to have remarked on the occasion of her death that he did, in fact, forgive all those who had attacked him personally, but that he would never, never forgive those who had attacked his wife. As for John Quincy Adams, he, like his father, was not gracious in defeat. He refused to attend Jackson's inauguration. Instead, he went home to Massachusetts. Two years later, Adams was elected to the House of Representatives, becoming the only former U.S. president to do so. In this role, Adams would be an outspoken congressional leader in the fight against slavery. That work, not his presidency, would become his greatest legacy. John Quincy Adams is the first president to have his photograph taken. He sat for this photo in 1843. Andrew Jackson called himself a Jeffersonian Democrat. Thomas Jefferson called Jackson a dangerous man. Thomas Jefferson didn't like men who bordered on fanaticism. And Jackson seemed to him to be, uh, at best, uncouth and at worst dangerous. But when you get right down to it, Jackson clearly was a lineal heir to the Jeffersonian legacy. Number seven, Andrew Jackson, Democrat, 1829 to 1837, 61 years old, from Tennessee. The hero of the common man, the old hero, old hickory. He was the type of man, it was a complex individual to say the least, as all great individuals are. He detested distinction of privilege. He really felt that he was a voice of the common man. But we mustn't misconstrue this. It doesn't mean that Jackson tried to uh, find out where public opinion was and then be guided by that. No. Jackson knew what he wanted to do and did it and then tried to enlist public opinion in support of what it was he wanted to do. Very few people were in between on, on Andrew Jackson. They either loved him or hated him. Andrew Jackson definitely captured the imagination of the common man. He was the first president to be born in a log cabin. He asked to be called General, not Mr. President. He chewed tobacco and smoked a pipe. He was a barroom brawler, a passionate Indian fighter, a gambler who brought his own racehorses to the White House, a duelist with two bullets in his body. A man who would fight at the drop of a hat, a man who considered personal honor above all else. He would challenge you to a duel or cane you in the public street if you said anything that reflected on his character, his honor, his integrity. He also had a furious temper, but he knew how to use it as a management tool. He would slam his fist, and yell and scream, and then afterwards when everyone left, he would look to someone and says, they thought I was mad, and this was to get his way. I think a psychologist would have found him a troubled man and would probably have recommended uh, medication, but he wouldn't have taken it. <laughs> if politics is personal, it's very, very personal for Andrew Jackson, and it's possible to look at Andrew Jackson's presidency as a war against uh, a number of individuals. Jackson's war began the moment he took office. Invoking the adage, to the victors go the spoils, Jackson simply cleaned house, firing his enemies and hiring his friends. By doing so, he created the spoils system in Washington. But established Washington society, he soon learned, would not be conquered in a day. 
first month in the office, what does he come up against? The Battle of the Petticoats. This was an embarrassing scandal that erupted over the social status of Margaret Peggy Eaton, wife of Jackson's Secretary of War, John Eaton. She, like Rachel Jackson, had dated her future husband while still married to another man. Because of this, the wives of the other cabinet members, led by the wife of Vice President John C. Calhoun, refused to socialize with the Eatons. Jackson absolutely hated this. He had just lost his own wife. She too had been scorned by established society. And so Jackson had a great sympathy for Peggy Eaton. Jackson told his cabinet members that their wives had to socialize with the Eatons, but the women refused to budge. The standoff lasted nearly two years. Finally, out of pure frustration, Jackson asked his cabinet members to resign, which they did. I think that one incident alone, his inability to manage his cabinet, indicates a lack of judgment, a lack of administrative ability, a lack of skill. He managed by strong will and by punishment. After the Peggy Eaton affair, Jackson placed no trust in his cabinet secretaries, whom he regularly hired and fired. He went through four secretaries of state. He went through five secretaries of the treasury, and so on. He was much more inclined to work through a group of informal advisors. This group of personal friends and political confidants soon became known as Jackson's kitchen cabinet. These were newspaper people, these were politicians, most of them uh, like Jackson from the West. Friends who got their name because they were said to come in the White House through the kitchen door. Other presidents had relied on personal friends for advice, but never to the extent which Jackson did. This angered his critics, but he didn't care. Jackson was determined to change Washington and America. And he did so with lightning speed. The first major piece of legislation that he recommended and got passed was uh, the Indian Removal Act of 1830. This act empowered Jackson to forcibly evict all the Indian tribes living east of the Mississippi River. Five Indian nations were directly affected. The Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Seminole, and Cherokee. Of the five, the Cherokee tribe, located in Georgia, chose to fight the eviction in a surprising way. Instead of going on the war path the way their fathers and grandfathers might have done, this generation of Cherokee Indians took Georgia to court. The case went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. In an historic decision, Chief Justice John Marshall ruled in favor of the Cherokee, saying they did not have to move. But Andrew Jackson thought differently. Jackson said to Marshall, he made his ruling, now let him enforce it. The result was that they were rounded up at gunpoint and, and forced to move. Their property was seized and they were um, forced west, of course, on the, the Cherokees forced to march. Uh, about one out of every four Cherokees died en route, which is why they call it the Trail of Tears. It is, without a doubt, the most controversial decision Jackson would make in his career. And it's one of the saddest chapters in American history. Soon after issuing the Indian Removal Act, Jackson faced a dangerous issue that threatened the fabric of the Union, the South Carolina nullification crisis. South Carolina was angry about the high federal tariff on imported goods, which helped New England at the expense of Southern planters. In response, South Carolina declared it had a right to nullify the federal tax. The person who articulated that theory of nullification most clearly was John C. Calhoun, Vice President of the United States. Jackson might have been more amenable to the argument that the tariff was too high, but he hated Calhoun because he thought he was uh, a personal enemy, and Jackson thrived on personal enemies. 
From a political standpoint, Calhoun believed Jackson would support him. They were both Southern planters, but Jackson's personal hatred of Calhoun precluded any political sympathy. Instead, he responded with force. Jackson threatened to have a civil war. He threatened to raise an army, go into South Carolina, hang John C. Calhoun from the first tree. Calhoun was said to have been genuinely scared for his life. But fortunately, cooler heads prevailed. South Carolina backed down, and Congress modified the tariff. As for Jackson, he made it clear that he was the supreme leader of the nation and that the Union was not going to fly apart under his watch. When Andrew Jackson ran for president in 1828, his opponents called him a jackass. Jackson liked the image so much, it became the mascot of the new Democratic Party. 1832, the last year of Andrew Jackson's first term, was a pivotal year in his presidency. After fighting petticoats, Indians, and secessionists, he suddenly faced his most daunting enemy, the Bank of the United States. The bank war was absolutely the central political uh, controversy of his administration. The bank war began in the summer of 1832, when Congress, led by Henry Clay, renewed the bank's charter, even though it wasn't due to expire until 1836. Clay pushed the bill through for political reasons and presented it to Jackson on the 4th of July. It's not immediately clear that Andrew Jackson has a problem with the bank. But once Henry Clay involves himself uh, in the bank recharter, then suddenly it becomes a battle royal uh, that Jackson has to involve himself in. Henry Clay was also running for president that year, and he was supported by the president of the Bank of the United States, a man named Nicholas Biddle. Both Clay and Biddle believed they could force Jackson to sign the bank bill. If he didn't, Clay would crush his bid for re-election. But the old general outflanked them. He's told that there is a cabal uh, between Biddle and Henry Clay. And once Jackson thinks of the bank in those terms, um, then this is something that absolutely has to be vanquished in his mind. It becomes, uh, in his term, the hydra-headed monster. He said to Van Buren, the bank is trying to kill me, but I will kill it. Typical of Jackson, he personified the bank fight by waging war against one man, Nicholas Biddle. Jackson saw Biddle not only as his own personal enemy, but the enemy of the people. The United States of America wasn't big enough for both Andrew Jackson and Nicholas Biddle. And uh, Jackson wanted to make sure that uh, it was Biddle who lost power. Jackson vetoed the bank bill, returning it with a simple yet powerful note in which he stated, the bill to continue the Bank of the United States was presented to me on the 4th of July. Having considered it with that solemn regard to the principles of the Constitution which the day was calculated to inspire and come to the conclusion that it ought not to become a law, I herewith return it to the Senate in which it originated with my objections. Nicholas Biddle called Jackson's veto a manifesto of anarchy. Jackson called it his mandate for re-election. Jackson saw this as an opportunity to strike out for the power of the ordinary citizen by smashing what he called the monster bank. He saw it as an absolute mandate of the people, that he was right uh, and the bank was wrong. In the end, Jackson's popularity won out. He crushed Clay in a landslide, then immediately moved on his mandate to close Biddle's bank. The bank still had four years left on its existing charter, and Jackson said, I don't want to wait four years. In the summer of 1833, while Congress was in recess, Jackson ordered his Treasury Secretary to redirect federal deposits from the Bank of the United States to various state banks. It was a very audacious move, in part because um, it wasn't even clear that what Jackson wanted to do was legal at all. His first secretary of the Treasury wouldn't do it. He replaced him. The second secretary of the Treasury wouldn't do it either. He fired him. 
So he went through three secretaries of the treasury before he installed one who would withdraw the money the way he was told. And when that was done, Jackson's enemies absolutely went ballistic. It was a power play of, of, uh, of ultimate dimension. When Congress returned and found out what Jackson had done, they censured him for his actions. The first and only president to be censured. As soon as the Democrats gained control of the Senate, however, they uh, had the censure not merely uh, rescinded, not merely repealed, but expunged, as if it had never taken place. By 1836, the Bank of the United States was dead. Unfortunately, Jackson did not have a substitute for the Bank of the United States, and this would uh, cause a lot of problems in Martin Van Buren's administration. Andrew Jackson's presidential legacy is, perhaps, the most complicated in American history. Without question, he changed the presidency, giving it more power by imposing his will on the economy, the government, the landscape, and the people. And by doing so, he forged the future of the nation. Jackson was the only president where a whole age would be named after him, the age of Jackson. And as one journalist would write, that the coming generations would be very proud to be born in the age of Jackson. But for the men who followed in his mighty wake, the age of Jackson would be a very bumpy ride. Under Andrew Jackson, the United States government was completely debt-free for the first and only time in history. He was the true father of Jackson's Democratic Party, having organized it in the 1820s. And he was Andrew Jackson's hand-picked heir in 1836. This endorsement gave him the election. Number eight, Martin Van Buren, Democrat, 1837 to 1841. Age, 54, from New York. Van Buren was the ultimate political protege and the ultimate political machine politician. The skills he had as kind of a backroom political organizer were great at making him a builder of a political party, but did not serve him so well in terms of, of actually leading the nation uh, as president. Van Buren loved the good life. And I think, in a way, that he wanted to treat the White House as a kind of reward for a lifetime of hard work. Unfortunately, history didn't cooperate. He got branded with a reputation that was almost entirely undeserved, and that is he got the reputation of being somebody who was a kind of wannabe aristocrat and was decorating the White House with gold-edged faucets and, and golden goblets and things, none of which was true. But Van Buren uh, conducted himself in such ways that it seemed like it might be true. He's seen as a man who is characterized, at least anyway, by his enemies, as an effete dandy. A man who uh, perfumes his whiskers and who wears a corset. It's not the kind of image which is really going to work very well in the rough and tumble world of American politics of the 1830s and the 1840s. When Van Buren took the oath, he certainly inherited the high hopes of Jackson's presidency. But he also inherited the financial ruins of Jackson's bank war. No sooner is he inaugurated than the Panic of 1837 begins. Van Buren got socked right off the bat with having to respond to an enormous crisis of, of unemployment, of uh, bankruptcy, of, of economic depression in all its ways. And it gets progressively worse um, as time goes on. In fact, there's another panic in 1839. The one in 1839 was even worse. It was caused fundamentally by a glut in the cotton market. And of course, cotton production was the backbone of the American economy. So when the price of cotton collapsed, uh, the American economy collapsed. No president had ever had to deal with anything like this before. I don't know that any president 
would have been up to the job, but uh, Van Buren certainly wasn't. As a man who had spent his entire career straddling the fence on issues, Van Buren was incapable of making tough decisions, such as the annexation of Texas. He ducked that question, fearing it would inflame the brewing slavery issue. As for the ailing economy, he had no real plan. By the time 1840 rolled around, the country was in such a deep depression that it would have been obvious to all observers that Van Buren was bound to lose, that the Whigs could have run anybody and beaten Van Buren. And if they had known that, the Whigs would have run Clay. But instead of nominating Henry Clay for president, the new Whig party chose William Henry Harrison because they believed he was the candidate who most resembled Andrew Jackson. Harrison had been a frontier general and an Indian fighter. But more importantly, he supported the rechartering of the Bank of the United States. The election of 1840 was a flamboyant affair, the first presidential campaign to feature open public rallies, songs, and slogans. They would roll out the cider barrel when Van Buren's people would start to speak, as well as uh, the image of the log cabin and with chants of, Van, Van, he's a used up man. They called Van Buren Martin Van Ruin. In contrast, William Henry Harrison was touted by his old war nickname, which he got while fighting Indians at the Battle of Tippecanoe. Tippecanoe and Tyler too was the slogan. John Tyler, of course, was Harrison's running mate. One of the great symbols of the campaign of 1840 is the log cabin. William Henry Harrison wasn't born in a log cabin, but nonetheless, this becomes sort of the enduring symbol of that campaign. And another symbol that the uh, Whigs manipulate very successfully is the image of the English coach that Martin Van Buren allegedly rides in. And the Harrison supporters like to sing, in English coaches, he's no rider, but he can fight and drink hard cider. Harrison took his lumps from the Van Buren camp as well. More than anything, they attacked his age. People accused him of being too old and of being a sort of phony Jackson, a phony general. They even called him a granny general. But ultimately, it was the economy that decided the election. Number nine, William Henry Harrison, Whig. March 4th to April 4th, 1841. 68 years old, from Ohio. Poor Harrison felt it necessary to give a very long and learned inaugural address, probably because in the campaign it had been suggested that he was a simple homespun guy. Harrison decided that as a president he needed a different image. Contrary to his campaign image, Harrison was hardly a backcountry bumpkin. He was an aristocrat, had a college education, and was the only president to study medicine. In taking the oath of office, Harrison wanted to remind people of his true background and dispel any adverse thoughts about his age. So he gave the longest inaugural address in American history, nearly two hours. He insisted on speaking on a cold March day uh, with no hat or overcoat. And uh, somehow he caught a cold, and the cold turned to pneumonia. And in the end, the uh, poor man died. Just 31 days into his administration, William Henry Harrison became the first US president to die in office. Vice President John Tyler was playing marbles at his home in Virginia when he learned of Harrison's death he immediately went to Washington to assume the presidency. But there was no clear constitutional guideline for succession. That set the stage for another epic battle in American political history. After becoming president, John Tyler refused to name a vice president. He served his entire term without one. He was a southern gentleman from the planter aristocracy, with a rich background in politics. He'd served in the House of Representatives and the Senate, been governor of Virginia, and was a consummate Washington insider. He believed in states' rights and felt strongly, like Thomas Jefferson, 
that too much power had been vested in the federal government. And yet, also like Jefferson, he expanded that power once he became president. Number 10, John Tyler, Whig, 1841 to 1845, 51 years old, from Virginia. One of the things that John Tyler has never really given enough credit for, I think, is the way he assumes all of the powers of the office upon Harrison's death. He gives an inaugural address uh, three days after he takes the oath of office and essentially sends a message uh, to members of the Whig Party and to the nation at large that he is in charge. And he proves that in the years that follow. He was a thin man, delicate, blue eyes. He felt that Congress should make policy, and this gave many of the impression of him, him being weak. And this was a great, great misconception. John Tyler of Virginia turned out to be his own man with his own political agenda, which surprised everyone. This became apparent from the get-go when Tyler faced immediate challenges to his newfound authority. He was derisively called his accidency or his ascendancy. Many believed he was just an acting president until a new election could be called. Even the members of his cabinet, which was really Harrison's cabinet, tried to muzzle Tyler's claim to power. In their first meeting, Secretary of State Daniel Webster told Tyler how the cabinet would make all executive decisions by consensus. To that, Tyler responded by asking for their cooperation or their resignations. For the Whigs, this was devastating. Harrison had promised to push Whig bills through Congress, including a new charter for the Bank of the United States. But Tyler didn't share the Whig view. What happens is really unprecedented, and uh, I don't think it's ever happened uh, since. The Whigs passed two laws authorizing a new national bank, and both of them were vetoed by President Tyler. After the second of these vetoes, the Whigs held a meeting at which they expelled President Tyler from their party. And from then on, Tyler was a man without a party. Politically isolated in the White House, Tyler pressed the business of the nation while imposing his will and skill as president. One of the things that Tyler's not really given credit for is his foreign policy achievements. Uh, you have the Webster-Ashburton Treaty, which is really a historic treaty between the United States and Great Britain. This treaty settled the disputed border between the United States and Canada, which was still a British possession. You also have the annexation of Texas, which is very, very controversial. Tyler took it upon himself to sign a treaty with the new Republic of Texas. But the treaty was immediately rejected by the Senate. That didn't stop Tyler. He cleverly asked for a joint resolution of Congress, and that passed. Unfortunately, it didn't improve Tyler's sagging political popularity. I don't really think there was any chance for Tyler to win a second term. He certainly thought about it, I think he wanted it, but the Whigs would have nothing to do with him by 1844, and the Democrats just simply didn't trust him. So he gracefully bows out. It becomes clear that the Democrats have nominated an expansionist like James K. Polk. In the fall of 1844, Americans elected a new president, a dark horse candidate whom nobody anticipated, but everybody embraced because he pledged to finish the work that Andrew Jackson had started. Number 11, James K. Polk, Democrat, 1845 to 1849, 49 years old, from Tennessee. The best way to understand Polk is to understand Jackson. Polk saw himself as someone who was going to fulfill uh, this Jacksonian doctrine. What would Jackson do? This is the, the mantra that Polk seems to repeat almost every day he's in office. The Polk administration, in effect, bookends the age of Jackson. He came into office with ample Jacksonian credentials and then 
achieved a whole series of Jacksonian measures once he got in office. In many ways, he's perhaps more of a Jacksonian than Jackson is. He believes very, very strongly in this idea of a level playing field for the American people. I've said that Jackson and Polk were wedded to the hip and the head, and I think they were. I don't think if you and I sat down to dinner with the president of our choice, James K. Polk would come in the top 25. I think he was a great president, but that doesn't mean that he was a likable man. He also was quite a devious man. In contrast to his personality, Polk was probably the most accessible president in U.S. history. The White House, for all intents and purposes, in the 1840s is a community center for the rather small village of Washington. The Marine Corps Band plays on the White House lawn every Wednesday, uh, and this is open to the public. Polk also makes himself available twice a week to American citizens, and all that was required was to knock on the White House door and to give your card to the steward and to wait your turn. Polk really does see himself as the first servant of the people. Polk is often called the hardest working president in U.S. history. He was known for his long work days and had gas lights installed in the White House so he could work through the night. Polk was a hands-on micromanager as president. For example, he was the first president to really get uh, deeply into the budget. He was the first president to tell all the heads of all the departments, look, don't send your budget request straight to Congress. Send them to me. More than anything, James K. Polk wanted to fulfill the ideological promise of Andrew Jackson's presidency, what was then being called America's Manifest Destiny. He embodies it, this idea that the United States has a providential destiny to expand westward is something that he accepts implicitly. To Polk, manifest destiny was more than an idea. It was his presidential mandate. Polk had four goals, which he was dedicated to achieving in his four years as president. He said he would only serve one term. He wanted to settle the controversy between the United States and Great Britain over the Oregon Territory. He wanted to bring California into the United States. He wanted to set up an independent treasury to fix the credit mess that uh, had prevailed since Jackson. And he wanted to lower tariffs on imports into the American economy. To achieve his economic goals, Polk pressured Congress to lower the federal tariff and to establish an independent treasury. He succeeded. To achieve his territorial goals, he used force. First, he threatened war with Great Britain to gain the Oregon Territory. The crowd was raised, 54-40 or fight, 54th parallel, 54-40 or fight. And to his credit, he did not draw the line in the sand on that, end up in you know, the 49th parallel. Then he actually went to war with Mexico to settle the Texas border and acquire the Southwest and California. The Mexican War, fought between 1846 and 1848, came to dominate Polk's administration. And that, along with the acquisition of the Oregon Territory, became the legacy of his presidency. People don't remember, I'm sorry to say, uh, that Polk's greatness as a president has to do directly with the fact that in four years he did take the country from just west of the Mississippi all the way to the Pacific Ocean. From sea to shining sea, a ringing phrase, Polk gave it to us. He made us a continental nation.